Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Academy's Morrison and Planetarium, and in this presentation in the Benjamin Dean Lecture Series, I'm Bing Kwok, Assistant Director of Morrison and Planetarium. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's good to see you, and we hope you're all doing well. Now, uh, we also want to uh, say a big hello to our online audience um, viewing on YouTube. Members and donors of the Academy have remote access to the lectures via the Academy's membership portal at www.calacademy.org. Now, how many of you are here for a Benjamin Dean lecture for the very first time? This is your first one? Okay, a few. All right. And uh, how many of you uh, visited the planetarium for something other than a Dean lecture? Say, a planetarium show or nightlife? Okay. All right. So you're pretty familiar with what happens here. Um, something upcoming that we'd like to mention is that for the first three days of next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, the planetarium will be closed for routine, ma uh, routine maintenance, which is scheduled twice a year to fine tune and um, uh, inspect our uh, projector, projectors and other theater systems. Um, otherwise, they're running seven to nine shows every single day. So there's an awful lot of wear and tear going on. Uh, so it's a good opportunity for us just to make sure everything is working properly. During that time, we'll be offering tours of the solar system uh, on the uh, Science Today screen, which is not quite as immersive as the Planetarium Dome, but it's a, an opportunity to have a little more interactive experience with the, uh, the presenter. And then following the, uh, the following week on September 26th through 30th, we're testing some new technology for the hearing impaired. And for that test, we're temporarily replacing living worlds with uh, the award-winning Big Astronomy, People, Places, Discoveries. And if you haven't seen that show, um, it's uh, a, cut a look at the cutting-edge work being done at observatories in Chile with uh, a few words directly from the people who make that work all happen. So that's happening uh, in, over the next two weeks or so. Our next lecture in the Benjamin Dean series is on October 3rd, featuring Darlene Lim from NASA's Ames Research Center down in Mountain View. Someone from Ames is right there. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, she is the deputy project scientist for the Viper mission, which is a rover designed to search for water ice at the moon's south pole. Now that is scheduled for launch next year, late into uh, 2023, as part of the Artemis program that ultimately is gonna bring humans back to the surface of the moon. Uh, November speaker is still not yet finalized, but we're working on it, and uh, that'll be announced as soon as they are confirmed. But on December 5th, we'll be hearing from Dr. Robert Jedeke from the University of Hawaii, and he's a very fun speaker who will be talking about prospecting on the asteroids. So all of these um, are posted to the uh, workshops and lectures section of the Academy's website. Uh, and tickets are now available for, for those uh, coming lectures. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, please welcome the senior uh, director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization, Ryan Wyatt. Well, thank you, Bing. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce this evening's presenter and topic because uh, although those of you who've come to the Academy for a while know that the planetarium is a space where we talk about all kinds of science, including the science of understanding our own world and our place in it, many planetariums are focused only on astronomy and a lot of astronomers almost uh, prefer to kind of focus on things far away uh, and not always address some of the topics at home. But our speaker tonight, Adrian Kuhl from San Francisco State University, is sort of helping to bridge that gap. Um, background, growing up in New York City, uh, went to a um, little school in New Haven, Connecticut for as an undergraduate, and then Harvard University for her doctorate, and uh, then made the trip out west to do a postdoc at Berkeley, and eventually settled at San Francisco State. She's, um, her work focuses on really interesting stars and really interesting stellar environments like globular clusters. In fact, we were talking over dinner, she had an early planetarium experience with the digital planetarium to look at data sets around the uh, dynamics of globular clusters, these very dense conglomerations of stars that um, orbit our own Milky Way galaxy. But tonight, she's gonna be focusing on her work. I think we might see some globular clusters, but, uh, she's going to be focusing on her work for with astronomers from planet Earth. And so, without further ado, please welcome Adrian Kuhl.
Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, can people hear me? I'm not used to this. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. And thank you to the California Academy of Sciences for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, it's, it's really an honor uh, to speak in this amazing space um, that's been a leading voice uh, for sustainability and environmental education for so long. I also want to say how much I value the ties uh, between San Francisco State and Morrison Planetarium, um, with so many of our graduates uh, having worked here over the years, and some in the audience, hey! Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a lovely connection, and we value it greatly. Um, so I'm going to start off today uh, talking a bit about, yes, globular clusters, some of the research that my students and I have been doing at San Francisco State University. Um, and then I'm going to turn our focus to the pale blue dot, as uh, Carl Sagan put so beautifully, our only home, <sighs> and talk about Astronomers for Planet Earth. So this is an organization whose mission is to activate, mobilize, and empower uh, the worldwide astronomical community uh, to take action on the climate crisis. So we have, fortunately, up in the booth there, Matthew Wren of the Cal Academy, uh, control booth with the universe at his fingertips. And so with his help, uh, we're going to have some fun at the beginning um, and again toward the end, uh, traveling through space and time to get some perspective. Uh, first uh, on our galaxy, then on some of my favorite objects in our galaxy, um, and then on planet Earth. Uh, but, okay, now there's spotlights on me so I can't see you very well, but uh, I did, I did want to say, I did want to just get a maybe shout out. Any San Francisco State folks here? Yeah. Yahoo! Okay. Um, well, I was at Berkeley for a while. Any Berkeley folks here? Yes. Yeah, I thought there might be a few. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> um, any amateur astronomers in the audience? Woohoo! Woo okay. Um, anyone who's seen a star cluster? through a telescope in the audience. Woohoo! Yeah, okay. So, we're going to get uh, a super close-up, you know, kind of view that you can't really get um, in real life, and that's what's beautiful about this planetarium. Uh, we'll get to do that today. So, um, let's see. I have a pointer here somewhere. Let me find it. Excuse me. <laughs> now I need a little light on myself so I can find my pointer. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. Thank you. Okay, so we're starting in the, the night sky. Uh, no city lights, thank you. Um, tonight, um, not long after uh, the sun has gone down, and I really, I really love this time of year. Um, we have high up in overhead uh, the beacon of Vega um, that uh, shines through, essentially, no matter what, among the city lights. Often you can also make out on um, the entire summer triangle here, Deneb, Altair. And it's really nice to, to, to see those even from the city and, and kind of feel oriented. Um, the, uh, and then if you're in a darker place, you can make out Cygnus and the Northern Cross. And you can see that it flies through this disk, this, this milky light that uh, marks the disk of our galaxy. And so there's Cygnus and kind of points us towards the south. In the south at this time of year, we can still see really one of my favorite things, uh, the, the asterism uh, in Sagittarius called the teapot. Here's the spout and the top and the handle and the, the beautiful pot. And over setting in the, in the west, we can still see a little bit of Scorpius just poking up above the horizon there. So it's a really lovely uh, time of the year. One other thing that we can catch uh, at this time of year before it starts going down in the, uh, uh, in the west later in the fall is a little more subtly uh, a constellation uh, called Hercules. Some of you may know it, and here's the so-called keystone of Hercules. 
and slightly enhanced here, we have a fuzzy little ball that, uh, how many people here have looked at that fuzzy little ball through a telescope? Yeah, a few. <laughs> I, had a few <laughs> I had a feeling. So that, uh, uh, known to uh, uh, many of you, I know, I'm sure, as M13, Messier's 13th object. And um, uh, those are the things that I got interested in myself in, in graduate school. And, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, right now. Um, so that fuzzball turns out to be hundreds of thousands of stars whizzing around each other some 20,000 light years away in the halo of our galaxy. And it's held together by gravity um, and has survived some 12 billion years older than the disk. It's older than the disk itself of the galaxy. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, now there are more than 150 of these objects in the Milky Way, um, most of them too faint to see with the naked eye. But this is where Matthew is going to help us out and point them out to us. Where are all those globular clusters? There they are. OK, fantastic. So that's interesting. So um, one of the things you may notice is what astronomers noticed uh, about 100 years ago now, which is that there are a whole lot more of them over here than kind of pretty much anywhere else. So what's that all about? Um, so let's take a trip to the Southern Hemisphere, to the Chilean Andes, uh, where I spent some time as a graduate student. If you're studying globular clusters, it's a good place to go. Uh, you get a better view because they, 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 uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius will be high overhead. Let's take a look. And here we're going to head to the Saratololo Observatory, I believe, and then take a look at the sky. See what it looks like from there. Okay, and there we go. It's, uh, so how many people have been in the Southern Hemisphere and seen uh, the Milky Way, w w the center of the Milky Way, way overhead like this? Anybody? Yeah, okay. So there it is, Sag the teapot, and here's Scorpius way overhead. Uh, it's very, very fun to see that way. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people who work on globular clusters um, like to go to the Southern Hemisphere to do it. Um, and so you want to put the, the markers back up for a minute? Um, uh, so there we go. So, so in the 1920s, um, Harlow Shapley used globular clusters to figure out for the first time that we are not in the center of the Milky Way. And that was very much not what was thought at the time. Uh, star counts seem to indicate otherwise. Instead, the center is in the direction of Sagittarius. And if I can still see it here, it's a little harder to see. There's the spout right off the tip of the spout, kind of right about there uh, is where the center is. Now, uh, the, um, it's a little easier. Uh, well, and let me say, building on you know, discoveries uh, made by Henrietta Leavitt, he went on to make uh, the first measurement of just how far out in the boonies uh, we really are. And so Matthew's going to give us a better perspective on this. Let's check it out. head straight out of the galaxy, look back at it from a distance. You can see those globular clusters still. Let's see how well we can see them here. Maybe zo can we zoom in just a little bit more? Matthew, there we go. There we go. That's beautiful. And now maybe take a look from the edge and get a good feeling for uh, for this situation. Whee! This is fun. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. 
All right, look at that beautiful galaxy. Okay. Oh, right from the edge. Oh, now you really see it. Okay, so you can see all there are a whole bunch of globular clusters here. They are distributed in a big halo around our galaxy, but there's many more here. Now we live out here somewhere, but you can see why it worked. If you're looking uh, towards the center, you're going to see lots more clusters, and that's exactly what uh, what he did. So, um, okay, so let's. Uh, Let's take a minute now to go visit one in particular. And um, the, the one that um, uh, my students and I have been studying uh, quite a bit over the years is one of the few with a name, not just a number, Omega Centauri. And it's, why, is it why does it have a name? It's big and it's bright. It's the biggest uh, globular cluster actually in the galaxy. Um, I actually spotted it once out a bus window in Chile. That's how <laughs> bright it is, on my way to an observing trip. Okay, so let's check it out. Ooh, there it is. All right, so... <laughs> so the stars in clusters like this are in constant motion. Each one is responding to the combined gravitational pull of all the other stars. It's fun to imagine what it might be like if you lived on a planet orbiting a star in the middle of one of these clusters. The night sky would be full of stars as bright and brighter in some cases than Venus. Um, stars in the middle of clusters like this are light weeks apart instead of light years. That's, that's still pretty far apart. <laughs> but it's crowded enough in some of them that stars actually collide with each other now and then, unlike around here, fortunately. So interesting things can happen in the middle of these clusters. Now, a few years ago, I joined with colleagues to write some uh, NASA proposals to observe Omega Sen uh, with a Hubble Space Telescope and also with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And in a minute, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of those, couple of those images. Something I'll mention while we're still in the middle of Omega Sen here is that um, these clusters are so old that there's very little by way of he heavy elements in them. Um, and uh, people have gone looking for planets uh, and so far found none in globular clusters. Now, they are very far away, so it's a hard, hard thing to do, but it does seem like uh, the prevalence of planets is significantly lower by of order a factor of 10, if not more. Um, and, uh, well, it's also potentially a little bit perilous. Not, you know, you could have a planet close in to a star in principle, but uh, the, the, the uh, lack of heavy elements may be impacting the situation uh, as well. So I want to show a couple of pictures of um, uh, Omega Centauri and then uh, say a little bit more about uh, my pathway into, whoops, let's see, there we go. So there's our Hubble Space Telescope uh, image of Omega Centauri. And let's just zoom in just a little bit. Now, I don't know how well you can see the colors, but the brightest stars here are red giants. And then slightly fainter, uh, you may just be able to pick out if you've got a sharp eye here, slightly fainter are some blue stars in there. And those are ones actually that are manufacturing carbon right now as we speak, um, turning helium into carbon. It's kind of a, a, stunning, a stunning fact that all the carbon on Earth, in living things and in the atmosphere, as we'll be talking about in just a minute, came from stars. Not these, because they haven't burned out yet, but ones that burned out uh, long ago. So one question that's been around for a while is whether there are massive black holes in the middles of clusters like these. Not as massive as the one at the center of our Milky Way, you know, a few million solar masses, um, but much more massive than the sort of tens of solar mass uh, black holes that are left behind when massive stars die. Um, there aren't any confirmed intermediate mass black holes uh, yet um, in the sort of thousands of solar mass range. Uh, but if they exist, uh, we think that uh, globular clusters ought to be a good place to go looking. So I'm just going to take a minute to uh, show you uh, something that we did here. So um, uh, the uh, 
the issue, of course, is that black holes are hard to see, notoriously so. One way to look is, is in the X-ray, and that's because if there's gas in the vicinity of a black hole, uh, it will often fall in. <laughs> um, and on its way in, it, start, it moves very fast and gets really hot and emits X-rays. And so this is an X-ray image uh, now of Omega Centauri, actually an 80-hour exposure, three days of staring at this thing. And each little dot you see here is an X one X-ray that hit the, hit the detector during those 80 hours. And most of what we see here is just an accumulation of a uh, few X-rays from very, very distant galaxies. That's called the X-ray background. But where you see something bright, that's where there's some you know, source of, of X-rays that's probably that's in the cluster or potentially in the cluster. And we've identified some of those. Um, my students have identified some of those. Um, for example, these three uh, we identified as a kind of interesting kind of binary in which a white dwarf is... Um, is the, in which a normal star is losing matter uh, to a white dwarf. And uh, so we found a bunch of these. But, okay, I was going to say, I want to say something about the black hole. Is there a black hole? All right, well, here's what we need to do. We need to look carefully, and, and we need to know where the center of this cluster is. And you, you can't tell at all from this picture, but from that other picture, the Hubble picture, we can make those measurements and figure out where the center is. The, a black hole would be right in the center. So, I don't know, is, is one of those sources the black hole in the middle of Omega Sen? Well, where is the center? Right there. No sign of it. No sign of the black hole. Um, no, no emission above the background. Um, so, is there a black hole in there? We don't know. Um, maybe not, but there could be. Maybe there's just not enough gas uh, floating around uh, to fall into it. Um, so, stay tuned still looking for those intermediate mass black holes. So we've learned a lot about Omega Sen and globular clusters. Um, and, um, the, and there's more I could say, uh, but I'm going to stop there. And instead, I want to say that a few years ago, you know, I started questioning, why am I spending my time thinking about things that are quadrillions of miles away. That's a one with 15 zeros on it. Why am I doing that? It's fun. It's fascinating. And it's a, it's a huge privilege. But I was starting to get really concerned about what's happening here on Earth. We're in the midst of a climate emergency, and I'm a scientist, I'm a teacher, I started, it started feeling irresponsible to ignore what was happening. Well, it turned out I was not alone. <laughs> and uh, um, the Astronomers for Planet Earth uh, was founded by students uh, at San Francisco State, faculty and alumni at San Francisco State in 2019. Um, shortly after we launched, we were contacted by a like-minded group uh, of European astronomers, and we joined forces and have been working together ever since. Um, the, the network uh, includes, uh, is now more than 1,600 people from more than 70, 74 countries, six continents. Uh, who are we? We are students, educators, researchers, amateurs, writers, citizen scientists, anyone who's work or avocation or education connects them uh, to astronomy. And we come from all different settings, observatories, universities, schools, planetariums, institutes, and, and, and more. So I want to take just a minute uh, to say a couple things about the climate, um, for example, and I'm sure, you know, People here have seen things like this. The, um, the, you know, this graph of uh, time going back to 1880 to nearly the present time um, of the, the, the difference from the, the average in the 20th century to now just makes it you know, so, uh, so stark. The Earth is getting warmer, and it's getting warmer fast. Um, we can look at 
this animation from uh, uh, NASA to see, and again, uh, going back to uh, early 1900s now, to the present. Of course, there's always some variations in the temperature. You can see a temperature scale at the upper left. Always some variations, but once you start getting into 1980s and beyond, you really see things changing. And you can see um, how, you know, how the land is warming quickly, how the Arctic is warming quickly, and it's, it's really very stark. Of course, it's, you know, it's not the warming per se that's the problem. It's the effects of all that added heat, so much added heat uh, to the earth, to the, to the land and the oceans. Um, and the effect that that has on the increasing frequency of, of, of droughts and storms and flooding, we all know these, and fires, and the acidification of the oceans um, and the effects of that on marine life and fisheries, and sea level rise that threatens the existence of entire nations. So, you know, the effects are being felt everywhere, but there's also a there are also huge disparities. The people and countries least responsible for causing this problem are the ones experiencing the worst of its impacts. So, so what is the cause? Oh yeah, it's, there's no doubt. It's unequivocal, it's us. Uh, primarily, our burning of fossil fuels, which is increasing the concentration of heat-trapping greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, so methane and others, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. The current level of CO2 hasn't been seen in hundreds of thousands of years. So um, the sort of best summary of this that I've seen is from a climate scientist in, at the University of Lund, um, Kimberly Nicholas. Uh, it's warming. It's us. We're sure. It's bad. But, but, and this is critical, we can fix it. Um, there are so many solutions out there. But uh, we need to act fast as the uh, United Nations... Um, intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, uh, has, has said we need to reduce uh, our emissions by 50% by 2030. That's coming up really soon. And get all the way to net zero by 2050 to avert the worst of the, of the impacts um, that could happen. So, uh, but yeah, there are so many solutions. Uh, and I'll just Show a couple. Okay, we need to, uh, obviously we need to stop taking, you know, f uh, stop putting uh, carbon dioxide in the air. We need to switch to uh, uh, renewable energy. Um, so many things. Uh, solar panels, electric cars, there's so many, th so many different things um, that, you know, public transit, uh, plant-based diets, so many things. How we spend our money, how we uh, save our money. Um, and, and, and voting, so important. There are just a million different things to do, and we kind of need to get them all happening at once. There's no like one silver bullet uh, kind of answer in this, for this problem. We need to do lots of things at once and uh, help each other, help each other figure out what to do, how to do it, how to do it fast. So you may still be wondering like, okay, but like why astronomers? What, what do we, you know, what, what can we do? And I think Astronomers for Planet Earth really came together and has grown because we did feel like there is something th that we have to offer. And, and, and what is that? Well, part of it is, is you know, a certain kind of perspective on the Earth, right? The, uh, the, the pale blue dot image um, uh, taken more than 30 years ago now um, of the Earth. There you can just barely see it there. Um, from about, you know, past the orbit of, of Neptune, uh, really brings home how, how small our planet is, how isolated our planet is. Um, so it gives us some perspective, and I'll say more about this in, in a little bit. Um, we'll take a, take a trip and get some more perspective. Um, we're also scientists, and we have some expertise. We were familiar with uh, the kinds of things that it takes to model 
to, to make the models that climate scientists make, to interpret them. Uh, we work with you know, similar models in different contexts. Um, we're used to large scale things like this, so there's, there's adjacency there um, and familiarity there. Um, and of course, we are educate, you know, so many of us are educators. And I just want to say a little bit about that. So in the US alone, quarter million people take students take an introductory astronomy class every year. That's a lot of students. Many of them are future teachers, K-12 teachers. Um, amateurs and professional astronomers right, engage in a lot of informal teaching and star parties that we give and um, uh, public talks that we do. Planetariums, there are planetariums all over the world. Um, and one estimate I saw worldwide, something like 150 million people visit planetariums annually. So that's really a lot of reach for a relatively small, you know, otherwise small field. So there's potential there. So, um, so what I I'd like to do uh, now with, uh, with Matthew's help is get some more perspective uh, on our planet. And uh, in, in one way I want to do that is to talk about uh, the discoveries of exoplanets, right? I, I think um, uh, most of you will know that um, astronomers have been finding thousands of planets around other stars over the past 20, 30 years. And it's been an incredible time uh, to an incredible time of discovery and so many fascinating uh, surprises <laughs> in, the, in those discoveries. Uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, put, uh, put our own solar system in, in a brand new kind of context. And so uh, here we're going to see just the, the discoveries over time, starting in the 90s. And uh, let's see, there we go, okay. <laughs> Where are all the stars that have these planets that have been discovered? And you can see the accelerating pace of discovery. Um, the colors represent different mass planets. Uh, you can see there are quite a, f quite a few systems with multiple planets known. Um, yeah, they're everywhere. And <laughs> back behind you, you're going to see a whole bunch in one particular direction. That was when the Kepler satellite went up and, and, and stared at one patch of sky in Cygnus for a very long time. And now Matthew's going to take us out, <laughs> out outside this distribution so we can look back at it and you'll see that a lot of the, the known planets you know cluster around us but then there's this whole bunch this way up toward the Kepler field because that field was studied in so much detail it's kind of fun to see the distribution of known planets within the Milky Way it's pretty cool very cool so thousands are known when we extrapolate to the whole galaxy uh, there have been estimates that some hundreds of millions of stars may have potentially, potentially habitable planets around them. That is, planets that are in the zone such that, such that liquid water uh, could exist. So, so that's pretty wild. Um, let's, and so the next thing we wanted to do is take a trip to one of those exoplanets, because we can do that in this, plan in this planetarium. And so uh, Matthew is going to help us take a trip to the nearest known exoplanet, which happens to, and there are two of them actually orbiting, the nearest known star, other than the sun, uh, uh, called Proxima Centauri. It's a very faint star, but it's near. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a companion to a fairly bright star. Here is Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, and the Southern Cross which kind of points, by the way, at the southern pole, which doesn't have its own pole star. Proxima is nearby, uh, pretty faint, and we're going to get a clock on here, right, Matthew, in a minute? Uh, so t I want to set this up for a second. Don't start yet. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, yeah. I want to set this up. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a trip, okay, to Proxima Centauri, nearest exoplanet. Uh, but... Uh, it takes a while to get there, right? We all know stars are far away. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to speed up time so that 100 years goes by every second. And, and, okay, but wait, 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 oh, yeah, you beat me to it. <laughs> i got to set this up first. <laughs> um, and 
Uh, we're going to take the fastest spacecraft that's ever been built by human beings, which doesn't have humans on it, but it's the one, it's Park Parker Solar Probe, which reaches speed, has reached speeds of 430,000 miles an hour. I think we can agree that's fast. So we're going to go fast, but it's still going to take a while, so we're going to speed up time. So, yeah, every second, 100 years is going by. Okay, Matthew. Now, <laughs> can we get that clock? So here we go. We just started. All right, watch carefully. We're on our way to Proxima Centauri. And I can only imagine, as the generations go by, how many times kids have asked their parents, are we there yet? <laughs> and it's gonna, it takes a little while to see things. Hey, here's a, there's interesting Alpha Centauri. We can get a slightly different perspective on Alpha Centauri. So something's changing. All right, we've gotten to the year 6,000, 6,500, 66, oh, wow, okay, are we there yet? <sighs> Man, well, it's getting brighter, at least it's getting brighter. Now we can see it now. There it is, Proxima Centauri, getting a little brighter. You can still see the Southern Cross looking unchanged. Oh, man. Wow. All right, the year 8,000. Something like 200 human generations have to have survived on this spacecraft. All right, are we there? Okay, we're there. Let's take a look. All right, we're pretty close now, and I think that sometime in the year, you know, 8,000 something, uh, we'd be close enough to, to get a look at those planets decide if we wanted to actually make a landing. Let's take a look. Okay, all right, so Proxima Sen is a very uh, faint star, a very low mass star. It's very dim, and so <laughs> these, these two, the, there are a couple of planets going around. One has a five-day orbit. This one goes around in five days. This one goes around in 11 days. Believe it or not, that one is actually in the habitable zone <laughs> of that star, uh, which is to say uh, the star is so dim that you need to be really close to it to, have, uh, uh, to be warm enough to have liquid water. Um, nevertheless, I think we can agree. So that's cool. I think we can agree, though, that it's kind of far away. And <laughs> um, exoplanets are so awesome. But, um, but, uh, they are not a solution to our current dilemma. Um, so let me, let me just get a time check here. And, um, and I'm, I'm just going to go straight, Matthew, to the, to my next slide. Um, so there is no planet B, um, and we really need to take care of this one. And so I just wanted to say a few things about what Astronomers for Planet Earth um, has been doing. And um, so what are we doing? Um, so part of what we're doing is building kind of a, a toolkit for astronomers and a, and a community for astronomers. We're establishing a community um, and uh, so that we can help each other figure out how to do this work. Um, it's not, you know, we're not climate scientists. Um, we're not used to communicating uh, ab about climate science, nor do we necessarily feel comfortable uh, with the science itself. We have things to learn. So part of what we're doing is teaching each other and learning from one another about, about this, um, educating ourselves and one another. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of things with that, organizing conferences, special sessions, giving conference presentations. Um, uh, one of our members, uh, Travis Rector at uh, University of Alaska, organized a webinar series that where he's brought in folks from all over who can, um, again, help us in this sort of process of educating ourselves. We're sharing resources. Um, um, many, uh, many members um, have done a lot of the kinds of things that many others of us want to do. And so we're, we're sharing those resources with each other. And part of that process is creating a website. We have a website that we're building out those, those resources 
um, uh, these days. Um, and then you know, we're focusing on climate change you know, from an astronomical perspective. So, so you know, where do we do that? Well, many of us teach, teach college, some teach in K-12 classrooms, um, some teach in planetariums, give public talks, star parties, all kinds of different things. We also have a presence on social media. Um, our uh, uh, co-founder, Jessica Agnos, and her husband, Steve Agnos, have, been, have made an uh, amazing set of uh, vid video series you could find on, on Vimeo that have been used in many different settings, that are useful in many different settings and have also appeared on social media, sort of bringing the astronomical perspective to the problems, uh, the problem of climate change. Uh, and then, finally, we want, we want astronomy uh, to be itself an, a sustainable endeavor. So what have members been doing? So this is just a sample here of uh, quite a few members who have uh, written articles and uh, done analyses of the carbon footprint of, of their institutions or their observatories um, and have uh, written uh, articles about that. Um, and that's been very, you know, very interesting and useful for, for uh, those places to figure out, well, how do we, you know, what do we do? How do we improve the situation? We've been working on organizing sustainable conferences. Um, and um, members serve and work on and work with sustainability committees of, of different uh, astronomical uh, societies and institutions. Uh, and then we had an open letter campaign um, that, that calls on astronomical institutions all over the world to name sustainability as a primary goal and adopt sustainable practices, um, lower their carbon emissions. And it was signed by 2,800 and some astronomers uh, all over the world. So I want to show one of uh, the videos, uh, the AFERI videos of Jessica and Steve Agnos. And, um, and, uh, and then and I'll conclude. Hi. Namaste. Bonjour. Bonjour. Hello. Namaskar. Goodbye. We are a group of astronomers. And we have an urgent message to share. There will be some fire. Be prepared. We have a crisis. We'll only get worse if we don't stop burning fossil fuels. If we don't stop burning fossil fuels. We are the third generation. This clear significant impact on the climate crisis. Possibly the last one that can still make a difference. And the last one that can stop climate breakdown. But can we still stop climate breakdown? The progress has discovered thousands of planets and other stars. stars, but not a single one, but not one of them is on Earth. Even if there was one, it would be much too far away. It would be impossible for all of us to move there. The Earth. The Earth is our only home. We have to work together to preserve the habitability of our unique planet. We all need the Earth to sustain life. To sustain life. To sustain life now and for generations to come. So, become a climate activist yourself. Use that time to contact your political leaders and convince them to act now. To act now. Now. My name is Deborah Fisher, me dummy, deputy. My name is Sarah White. My name is Kyle. Mazanal Ahikuti. My name is Yasmin Pasha. You do not know me, but first my name. My name is Michelle de la Paz. It's been Victoria Gunda. My name is Jasmine Mahama. Your shop is Luis Falsada. My name is Imani Ray Pierre. Je m'appelle Christine Campanini. My name is Diego Maradona. My name is Antonio Alas. We are astronomers for planet Earth. So uh, I I want to I want to end there, but just uh, make a couple uh, couple final remarks. Um, 
uh, and partly I'm thinking of this quote from uh, from Jane Goodall. Um, yeah, we all, you know, what we do makes a difference, um, and then we have to decide, you know, what what to do, and what kind of difference we want to make. And um, I have found and and uh, that working with other people really makes all the difference <laughs> to, to make it possible to do things that you, you want to do and that you care about doing. And so um, I hope that some of you will consider joining Astronomers for Planet Earth and um, would love to hear the Q&A, uh, what other people are doing. There's so many organizations doing amazing work around climate change. And uh, there's nothing like having a group of people to, to do the work with to, to figure out how to, how to move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. And as Adrian said, we're really excited to open up the floor to Q&A. So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and either Bing or I will come find you with a microphone. Uh, please wait for the microphone to arrive just so everyone can hear. And again, we're broadcasting this online. So we may have a few questions from online, but also so everyone who's listening online can, uh, can hear any questions posed here in the, in the dome. So, Okay, we have a question up here on uh, toward the top. We'll start with one in the center right here. Thank you, Adrian. Nice talk. I really appreciated the effort that you're putting in for climate change. I'm wondering if you have tried to collaborate with other organizations, especially with Project Drawdown, which has solutions that are totally workable mm -hmm. and are easily accomplished if we have the finances to do it. So what do you think of all of that? I, I think it's... Uh yeah, that, that's an amazing project. I think absolutely we all need to learn from each other. I have learned a tremendous amount from uh, reading uh, and learning from Project Drawdown. Um, and yeah, I think all the kinds of ties and connections we can make to help each other figure out how to do this are super important. Um, you know, the one thing I can say about Astronomers for Planet Earth is it's an all-volunteer organization, so <laughs> there's kind of limited capacity to do certain things, although, you know, we may, we may improve on that, but, but absolutely uh, we wish to collaborate uh, with other organizations doing things. That's uh, super important to us, and the idea is, yeah, learn from one another, and uh, there's so much to learn from that project. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So our next question from your right-hand side, a little bit higher up in the dome. Hi, I uh, was initially uh, motivated by compassion rather than curiosity. So I got my degree in anthropology first, mm. and then later on, you know, to heck with this, uh, I'm much more interested in physics and math and astronomy. Uh, what do you think that in the 70s, when I was getting my degree, Leon Letterman started this campaign to teach physics first and life oh, yeah. sciences second? I, I wondered what your opinion was about that. Oh, that's very interesting. I actually know, you know, my father was a physicist, and I know Leon Letterman, uh, <laughs> I knew him quite well. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea. I can't say that I've thought myself, you know, I, conceptually I get it, right? Because physics is so kind of nuts and bolts and, you know, this makes this happen. It's very, uh, whereas biology is so complicated. <laughs> I think for me, certainly, that would have been a, a better route. Um, I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion either way. I would want to hear from, you know, the biologists, well, you know, what do they think about that? And, you know, because um, I have a very physics perspective <laughs> on, the, on the question. But it's a very interesting question and, and one worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Any other uh, opinions From about the that? the other end of the same row. Hello. Uh, so a lot of times when talking with, like, students or people in the public, uh, the solution they come up with and not instead of exoplanets is what if we just terraform Mars? So um, what would be your answer to that? You know besides like financially and getting all the people to Mars like what are the scientific reasons why maybe that's not so viable? 
Thank you for that question, Katie. Uh, I, one of the things I skipped uh, that Matthew had ready for us was a trip to Venus and a trip to Mars, but we were running a little bit late, so we skipped it. So yeah, you know, we, the exoplanets are really far away, but wait, there's planets in our own solar system, why don't we just go there? So yeah, I mean, you know, what, what I can say about, about Mars is just that, yeah, there are you know, plans to go there, but to me, the amount of work it takes you know, to get a few people to be able to go there and hopefully survive is enormous. It's astonishing how much work it is. And uh, that right there says, this is, you know, we gotta, we gotta fix this problem soon, right? We gotta get 50% <laughs> go down, you know, cut emissions 50% in the next eight years and then another, you know, down to net zero by 2050, you know, it's cool, you know, this Mars stuff is really interesting, but I think in itself kind of um, shows the importance of preserving our own planet. Because if it's that hard, you know, if it's that hard to, to make it possible to live on Mars, it just shows, you know, like, oh, well, let's not take the habitability of our own planet for granted. It's amazing how habitable <laughs> this planet is if we don't mess it up. <laughs> I think we have our next question, but I would center. just make the comment that too, that if, if you're talking about terraforming Mars, if, we, if you could terraform Mars, then you should be able to keep the to currently habitable planet habitable. So, <laughs> yeah, question a, um, would be, <clears throat> any thoughts on the kind of the geoengineering, which is ter re-terraforming Earth, if you will, but uh, you know, there's you know, everything from putting iron in the ocean to floating mirrors in space, et cetera. Comments? You know, uh, I, it, <laughs> I don't think humans have a great track record of like messing with stuff and then making it all work out. You know, we, we forget about all the very complicated interactions between so many different things. So, you know, whether any of those things will be required, uh, I don't know, but I hope we can really work hard to not have to take uh, sort of crazy measures that are potentially, you know, really problematic. And it's hard to anticipate what effects might occur. Um, so, yeah, I, that is, that is far down the list <laughs> of what to, what to do. I think in, in a way that the thought that we might have to do something like that should just tell us like, oh my gosh, we need to do the things that really are very straightforward. It just takes it takes do, we, we've got to do them. Um, and then hopefully we don't have to do any of the other kind of crazy stuff. That's my, my feeling. So next question from your right hand side all the way at the very top of the dome. Hello, uh, <clears throat> a wonderful presentation, first of all. Uh, I, I kind of have two questions actually. The first is uh, as physics educators, uh, so very different than terraforming stuff, but uh, as phys physics uh, and astronomy educators, what should be our priority in uh, getting across this information and how do we, you know, work this in in a way that uh, makes sense to show students that we need to do something and here's why astronomy is that reason. That is a great question. Let me say physicists also, I mean, you know, it's, physicists are welcome in astronomers. It's, a, it's um, there's so many ways we can do it and one thing, the thing I want to say at the outset is students want this. They want us teaching them uh, about this topic, and if we can, we we can do it in physics classes. We can do it in astronomy classes as part of what we do. And it's partly like, what examples do we pick, right? There, you know, there's so much physics in all the solutions, you know, to uh, climate change. Uh, so it makes for great examples of all kinds of things. So um, yeah, I would actually encourage you to 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 join astronomers for planet Earth and 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 ask that question to you know, at our Slack space, and there'll be lots of answers <laughs> from lots of people who've tried lots of different things, and there's, you know, one in the audience here who's done a lot of teaching about this in his astronomy class, uh, but there are many people who are doing it, um, uh, uh, multiple faculty at San Francisco State, and faculty all over, all over the place, so, yeah, join us. Um, but I would say, yeah, use the physics in the solutions, because people want solutions, right? I mean, we've heard about what a crisis it is, what do we do? We need to know what to do. So. Awesome, and then the, the follow-up, sorry, the follow-up to that was just how do we join? 
Oh yeah, you uh, go to our website, astronomersforplanet.earth. Uh, maybe I can put it back up here. Or is it, I guess it's just washed out. Anyway, Astronomers for Planet, it's all one long thing, astronomersforplanet.earth. And hit the join us button and fill it out and, and you're in. <laughs> Welcome. One more from the very center. Um, when I think about what astronomers in particular could do for uh, this cause, obviously one of the main hurdles we have to uh, overcome is winning over minds of a bunch of people who are not necessarily bought in on uh, certainly the solution, but possibly even the cause of the problem. My intuition is that uh, astronomy sits in a really sweet spot um, for a lot of people where there might be a lot of trust. But, uh, you know, it's, I, I would guess that between astronomy or per and then perhaps zoology or biology, <laughs> that's where people really get kind of hooked on science. Mm -hmm. But astronomy, because it's normally so uninterested with what's going on uh, on Earth, potentially is seen above the fray. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, is there any data on or, or polling on whether astronomers are particularly trusted and are you actually a really great vessel for trying to win people over? I, I would <laughs> <laughs> we would love to know the answer to that. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, um, and, but it's a, such an interesting question. It is part of what's on our minds, um, for sure. Um, like I said, uh, of course, we're all used to just you know, talking about black holes and you know, exoplanets and stuff, and uh, talking about communicating about climate change. As you said, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Um, and so we do need to educate ourselves about you know, how to do that well. Um, but we hope, I hope, that there is, as you say, a sweet spot there. Um, that there's not only the audience, because you know, so many people come to planetariums and go to take astronomy classes and, uh, and all of that, and read astronomy in the news, um, but there's, there's maybe a little bit more. Maybe it's like, maybe there's some trust. I don't know. I can't, I can't judge it. Oh, Je Jessica has a hand up. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I'm one of the members of Astronomers for Planet Earth uh, that helps Adrian put some messaging out. Um, and just to say that yeah, we're banking on that, essentially. <laughs> we're banking on the fact that we do have, I read in an article somewhere that um, the one, the, or there's two subjects that um, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, that people enjoy regardless and that's dinosaurs and astronomy <laughs> so 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 we're kind of using that as a common ground to say you know first we pull you in with hey you're interested in astronomy and then we really try to use astronomy and the perspective that it gives you to just as we did on this trip which was beautifully done by the way um to shine a light on earth and say we're all in this together and hopefully spawn, spawn some compassion and empathy for one another and the planet that we live on to say, let's work together and use astronomy as a tool of unification, um, which is something that, you know, here on this planet, we don't usually get behind too well, so. Has anyone reached out to paleontologists for Earth? <laughs> <laughs> It's actually, yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, I do, there's a former faculty member uh, at San Francisco State um, who now runs the Paleontology Museum at, at Berkeley. I have to ask her that question. <laughs> so actually, since I don't see a hand raised, if I could do director's prerogative and ask a question. Um, you mentioned in passing some of the work that astronomers have to do to reduce the carbon footprint of astronomy. So I'm wondering if you could maybe comment on that. You know, I think we have this idealized image of astronomers who maybe are sitting in the quiet night uh, at the eyepiece of a telescope, but maybe don't think about the industrial scale of mm -hmm. astronomy. So just maybe your, your comments on that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Absolutely. So it was, it's was it been very interesting to see the um, results of these studies that I mentioned that some uh, folks have done of institutes and actually uh, one of our members um, did a, 
analysis of Australian astronomy's footprint. Um, and depending on sort of where you are and what you're doing, what the, the sort of largest part of the footprint vary. One thing certainly is flights, right? Because many of us, you know, fly to Chile, for example, or, you know, from Australia, fly somewhere. So flying is a big part of the, the footprint of uh, some, some astronomers. And, and in Europe, I mean, this is just, here's a great example, right? In Europe, uh, obviously in some places, you know, there's like no other way to get there, but a lot of observatories now you can do remote observing. So encouraging remote observing is, is a good thing to do. And, you know, many places are doing that already and we can do more of it. Um, but uh, a great example here uh, of, of how things can change is that in Europe, you know, there are a lot of places you can get to uh, for conferences, because the other thing is conferences. Uh, you know, all the flights that are involved in getting to conferences. Uh, well, there are a lot of places you can get to in Europe by train. And so one of the papers by uh, uh, Leo Bircher, who's one of the uh, Europeans who, who contacted us so early on, was uh, looking at, like, you know, uh, what the carbon footprint of a, uh, a conference, the European Astronomical Society conference was, and, um, you know, how much it could be reduced if you just let people take trains. And all, all that, so institutes are starting to do this, actually, say, it used to be you'd have to go the cheapest way. Well, the cheapest way might be, a, might be a plane, but a little more expensive, but not hugely more expensive, is a train, and then you have a way lower carbon footprint. So just changing the rules, you know, in your institute of, like, what do you have to do when you d take a trip? It can make it, that can make a difference. So anyway, so, so flights are one, a big part, because astronomers fly all over the world, to conferences, to observatories, and we can reduce that. Um, second thing is, um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, uh, computing turns out to be a surprisingly <laughs> significant fraction of our carbon footprint. Well, that, then it just depends where the energy is coming from. So it means really important to put pressure on the places from which we get our, do our computing to make sure that, you know, that energy is, um, is from renewable sources. Um, so those are, those are two examples. But there's also, uh, you know, work being done by, uh, folks uh, at NSF and, and elsewhere to specifically focus on the observatories that you know NSF runs to reduce the carbon footprint of those you know observatories. Get solar panels, get you know, uh, uh, focus on that actually and analyze it and then fix it. So things are happening. Things are happening. So we have time for a few more questions. Hi, thank you. What is the carbon footprint of launching the James Webb or the Hubble? <laughs> or that, yeah, that's how does it compare to commercial flight? Uh, you know, I don't know. This is a great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but it has to be large. <laughs> yeah, it looks like so, it is. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, actually, it would be, it would be great if someone, some, uh, that can't be too hard a problem to, to look at. You know, what, what, how much carbon got put into the atmosphere due to this specific project? I'm sure that could be figured out. Um, but I don't know that it has been. I don't know if anybody has analyzed that. But it would be a good, little, good project. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Cool. Um, so the state of our planet really lies on a spectrum, right? At, are these targets, you know, for like eight years, 50%, you know, by 2050, like carbon neutral, is that meant to stop us where we're at? Or is it just to avert disaster? Is it to like bring us back to the good old days? Uh, okay, that's a, that's a really good question. So that, those targets are to keep us as close to, you know, the, the way a lot of this stuff gets measured is how, um, how much warming will there be above a certain, sort of certain level? Um, and right now, we've, since pre-industrial times, the Earth has warmed a little more than one degree Celsius. And what the studies uh, that have you know, been done and collected by the um, IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, have found is that if we go much over one and a half, things will really get much worse. So even going to two, <laughs> is noticeably worse than one and a half. On our current trajectory, we don't even stay at two. We'll go past there. 
So we need to reduce it. Um, there are some, you know, there are some baked-in things. Some, it's going to get wor you know, worse before it gets better, but everything we do now will, make, will help. And so anyway, where do those numbers come from? They come from trying to keep the warming limited to not much more than 1.5 C degrees Celsius. And that's because um, a, study, the, the report, a report came out in 2018 from the IPCC showing that the difference between 1.5 and 2 is really surprisingly large. The impacts that will, will, uh, the world will uh, you know, uh, experience are noticeably different, even in that half degree difference. One more back from the very center. So um, we, you brought up Webb, or it was brought up. So is there any pushback from the astronomy community to say we shouldn't be doing these big, expensive, wonderful projects that are so near and dear to our hearts? And do you get pushback from fellow scientists as, you know, I, you know I'm stuck in the stars and I can't, that's it. I don't have no time for this. So it's uh, a question of how much and how much push do you, are you doing to say, well, we got to pay attention here closer? Because as you know, often people say, why are we sending rockets to Mars? We should, or the moon, why should be taking care of things here? Um, you know, this is a young organization. So the, the one thing I can say is that um, in, in that particular, well, l let me say a couple things. Um, I personally, in, in, in so many interactions I've had, have had very little pushback. People actually, so many, so many people wanting to do this, many, many more than people saying, oh, why are we bothering? In fact, I, I personally haven't experienced anyone saying this is a waste of time or we shouldn't do it. However, <laughs> of course, I haven't been in some sense on the front lines of certain things and some of our members uh, serve on sustainability committees at institutes and of, of uh, astronomical organizations. And there, that's really front line for, you know, making astronomy a, a sustainable uh, endeavor because that's where like conference choices about how conferences are held have to be made. And are we gonna have the conference be, you know, over Zoom or is it gonna be, you know, 7,000 people flying in from all over the country to one place or how are we gonna do it? Um, and there, there is definitely resistance. Like, oh no, we have to have our, you know, conferences. And, and you know, I'm not saying that there shouldn't ever be, you know, any conferences again and no one should ever fly a plane, I'm not saying that. Um, just being aware of it and thinking about ways to, you know, ways to cut down. And one of the interesting things is that, that we learned, I think, uh, during COVID and, and, and when we had to have conferences on Zoom, is that there are some advantages, actually. People who otherwise just can't get to meetings, who can't afford it, many more students came, uh, people from further away, people who have kids at home and can't just leave them for, you know, a week. Uh, so many, so there's a lot of advantages to, um, you know, having alternative ways to have meetings. So this is one example. So we've been, you know, trying to work on uh, uh, things like that. And so there is pushback, of course. And, you know, I think some of our European colleagues who've been working um, with the uh, European Astronomical Society have, have felt quite a bit of pushback as well. So it's there. <laughs> but, you know, on balance, there's been just so much outpouring of, of desire to, to do something. It's, it's, it's encouraging. One last call for questions. Well, I guess with that, I, I will, since you mentioned conferences, I will just note that I remember going to a conference in person and uh, the uh, Astronomers from Planet Earth session was in a, not tiny, but but relatively like mid-sized room and it was filled to overflowing because mm -hmm. there was so much interest in it. So hopefully that builds well for the future of uh, the organization and for the future of Astronomer for Planet Earth. So thank you again for you. taking the time to talk to us this evening. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Yes, thanks everyone for coming. And please have a safe trip home. If you have any questions uh, for Dr. Cole, she'll be down here to answer a few more. So thanks again.